Welcome to this episode of The Wolf and the Shepherd. Today we have with us Corby Mitleide, who is a psychic, an author of many books, including the latest release, The Psychic Yellow Brick Road. Corby, glad you could join us today. Delighted to be with you. Now, Corby, um, before we start, I wanted to ask you, what's your favorite psychic joke that you've heard that somebody has said in terms of a pun or anything? Because you must hear them like constantly all the time. Right? Almost like lawyer jokes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's always the um, uh, what happens when you've got uh, a dwarf medium who got out. It's small, medium, and large. The one <laughs> I hate, hate is when um, I ask someone a question. And they go, You're a psychic. You should have known that. <laughs> it's like, boom. Yeah, right. You're not going there. Okay, so probably shouldn't tell her about the text message from yesterday where uh, we had to kind of rearrange our time a little bit for today. Mm -hmm. And so so the wolf said, yeah, I got all that squared away. She's good. And, and so I said, well, she probably already knew we were going to do that anyway. So <laughs> No, um, I don't even go look. Do you know how busy my schedule is? I can't have time to look at my crystal ball and go, are they going to keep their appointment or not? No, it happens. Right. It happens. D so. But what? But did you say that in like the count from Sesame Street voice at the time, or? No, that's my <laughs> Madam Hoo Ha and oh, Swami okay. Swalanda voice. Right. Oh. Now, no. as funny now, as funny as some of those puns are, yeah. I think it does show an underlying kind of ignorance as to really what a psychic is and what a psychic does. They believe it's some kind of fortune teller who's staring in a crystal ball who knows everything that is going on all of the time and you know there, there's a big misconception about psychics you've got one side where people think you know it's like necromancy and witchcraft all rolled into one mm -hmm. and there's the other side which you know thinks you're completely bat poop crazy um so which, yes. which, which is which is the most common reaction you get people who think you should know literally everything or people who are kind of clutching onto the cross around the neck while they're talking to you actually it's a cross no pun between clutching on to oh my god she believes in the devil and you're entertainment you're a trick dog perform right uh-huh i mean i have had people come up to me at my booth at a psychic expo and say I don't know. Tell me something you couldn't know about me. And if you're right, I'll have a reading. I smile and say, I'm sorry. I don't roll over and fetch either. And I turn mm. my back and they do not get a reading. Right. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, just like anything, like you say, the dog and pony show or, or the, the circus act or whatever, it's always that kind of, you know, I'm thinking of a number between one and 10, you know, if you're a psychic, you're going to be able to do that or whatever. I mean, that, that's somebody mm -hmm. like me, that general public that kind of thinks, Oh, that's what it is. Uh, you know, they're mind readers or, or things like that, which is not what it is at all. Yeah. And what that does also is it says people think we have no boundaries. Right. And one of the people who really pushes that button is the long Island medium. They right. show her walking uh -huh. up to somebody in the local Wegmans and they're looking, do they want a pepperoni or a, you know, a Hawaiian pizza? And she goes, excuse me, I have a message for you from your Aunt Dora. Your back tire, it's bull. You're going to die in a week if you don't get it fixed. Just telling you when she walks away. Yeah. What the? Mm. That, yeah. no, no, no. That's, that's yeah. so wrong and so unprofessional. Well, I think and that's she can't do that legally. Yeah. That's what gives it a bad name because, you, again, you get all this thing where like, oh, well, if they were really psychic, they'd know what the lottery numbers are and they'd all be living in huge mansions and all this kind of crap. Yeah. yeah. That's why when somebody says lottery numbers to me, I go, well, number one, me first. <laughs> and if the psychic is not at least driving a Lexus, how do you know she knows? Right. Um, that's not what spirit guides are here to do. They're not here to give you the lottery numbers or to tell you that this is going to be the love of your life they're concerned with your spiritual growth mm -hmm. if you say should i buy the red car or the blue car they will say which one are you drawn to back to you because free will is why we're down here it's how we learn yeah you know, your, your russian lit teacher would not hand your cliff notes and the answer to the midterms when you walk in the door well i think most people feel comfortable of this some form of uh i guess predestination that they've got something set out in front of them and 
anything which kind of wobbles that a little bit some people get out of their comfort zone and mm -hmm. so they want to hear things that comfort them they want to hear they're going to be rich they're going to meet a tall dark handsome stranger i mean you've been dreaming of that for years still That's hasn't true. happened no, so we married not. a mexican lady instead um but yeah there's there's so many misconceptions out there and i don't know if i've ever really seen a tv show which is taking it seriously, which hasn't been on at like four o'clock in the morning or something. It, it always seems to be this kind of area of mockery, even if they claim to be examining the topic. Well, seriously. not only that, but even on the side of the serious ones versus the, like she said, the Long Island medium or whatever. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember the lady's name that was on Montel Williams, I think, all the time. I mean, you could almost Sylvia go, Brown. Sylvia Brown, there you go. Uh, you could kind of say that was supposed to be the serious side, but at the same time, she was on Montel Williams, you know, right. daytime talk show TV. So you kind of don't put that into consideration as much as, say, you know, a primetime television show, something like that. Yeah. Well, look, I'll be honest with you. Reality shows don't want reality. Um, I came this close to getting my own reality show, but I balked at their saying, we have to prove that nobody can do what you do and you're so special. And I said, that's counter to what I have told people in my business for 20 years. I'm not special. You can do what I do. We're all wired the same. Uh, the example I give is we all have 10 fingers. So all of us can play chopsticks. Some of us, if we're really interested, we'll learn to do scales and we'll practice and we'll get decent. And one 10 million is Elton John, but we all have 10 fingers. They said, no, that's not going to work. You know, you have to look special. I said, not going there. Mm. Because no, to me, that would be embarrassing and putting the lie to everything I've devoted my life to. Right. And so, of course, kind of giving you that segue there, devoting your life, part of what you've devoted your life to then has been kind of not so much. And of course, you've done this done the psychic readings and all that, but kind of mm -hmm. gearing people towards realizing their abilities. Uh, to use your example, you know, nobody's really going to know whether or not they can play the piano until you put a piano in front of them and then kind of show them how to play chopsticks. And, you know, maybe they pick it up really quick and you say, okay, let me show you something else. Or it takes them a year to be able to play chopsticks. And you say, well, you know, holler at me in a year and I'll show you the next thing. Or they say, I don't want to sit down there, and they just leave. Those are the ones who believe there's nothing at all to this. Um, the whole point is, I mean, I did not start out reading in my crib. Um, the way I put it is the 30-second elevator speech. When I was nine, I read a book called The Witch Family by Eleanor Estes, and I said, wow, there's magic in the world. I want to go find it. Fast forward to 1973 when I was a senior in high school working part-time at Spencer Gifts. They had the James Bond 007 tarot deck and I bought it. And for 20 years, I read for friends with the cards because I love the stories they were telling. But when you do that, you also work on clearing out your own stupids. 1994, I could do hands-on healing and talk to dead people with no training. That was basically when the universe said, hello, you're working for us, here's your draft notice. And I did it on the side with a very checkered career, actress, author, inspirational speaker, video producer, executive recruiter, uh, writer for a graphic novel series called ElfQuest for 10 years. But when my husband and I watched the towers burn on 9-11, I looked in and I said, look, I have got to do this work full time. People need to know there are some other answers out there. And he said, I believe in you go do it. So for a year, I still worked as an executive recruiter, 70 hours a week did the psychic work evenings and weekends to make sure I could make a living at it. As of 2002, turned my back on corporate America and have been doing this ever since. Work six days a week, 14 hours a day, read about a thousand people a year. And I get to get up in the morning. I don't have to get up in the morning. That's a big difference. Kind of like the old saying, you know, if you do something that you love, you're really not working, you know, basically is what you're kind of alluding to there. I mean, it, you probably would work seven days a week if you really wanted to, but hey, everybody's got to take a break and, and take a rest. I used to, and I was burning out. So for me, Wednesday is the day that I make myself put the closed sign up, do the laundry, do the groceries, do any doctor appointments, date night with my husband. You know, that's my day. Yeah. Now, what are so the most kind of common uh, 
request you get i should imagine kind of like who am i going to marry um does bruce love me yeah can you tell me if my dead aunt carol um likes me or whether she still hates me from beyond the grave and that type stuff i mean is that the most frequent type stuff i mean that's the i guess the projected image that we get of psychics they're just there to ask the most frequent is romance Mm -hmm. is bruce love me after that is career um especially these days and people who know that I used to be an executive recruiter, you know, who else would you ask? Um, Mediumship for me is very different. Don't sit down and say, well, who's around me? No, I want the dog tags so I can get them fast. For instance, my father, Jerome Richard Dorkin, who died in 2001 at the age of 80. Notice that doesn't tell me anything, but it gets me into the energy. And the way, um, my guides work is it almost becomes charades. You give me that information and as I connect in, if I do this, they smoked. If I do this, they had surgery. If I do this, it was a fast death. Um, I don't know how I do it, don't ask me. But it gives much better information than yes, it's a rose and he loves you. Two examples. There was a woman who wanted to speak to her father-in-law. All of a sudden I find myself miming a pool cue. He had taught her how to play pool. Another woman wanted to speak to her grandfather. This was up in Ontario. I find myself doing this. Now, if people know Americans salute with a palm down, Brits and Canadians salute with a palm out, and that's what I did. Why? She had graduated from the Royal Canadian Mounted Police Academy the week before, and she hadn't told me that, but she knew exactly what that was from her grandfather. Mm. So for me, that's fine. You don't all cook the same way. You don't all build a house the same way. This is simply how my guides have chosen to work with me. And enough people have felt I got their dead people that I'm comfortable doing it. Gotcha. Let's back up a little bit. You talked about uh, Spencer Gifts and getting that first set of tarot cards, the the James sure. Bond tarot that was, cards. That was the year Live and Let Die came out. So it was right. Right. Gotcha. Right. So uh, tarot cards, a big part of uh, psychics and readings or whatever. Can and you give us? And movies and yeah. Right. Can, <laughs> can, can you give us like a, a 30,000 foot view of, you know, tarot cards and you know, how that works and what somebody might be able to garner out of a tarot card reading. Ta-da. Well, number one, remember, this is ink on paper. There is no mystical energy. Um, tarot has been around for hundreds of years and there are certain rules. Tarot cards will have 78 cards, four suits and your majors. And it depends on how good the reader is. No, I don't tell you exactly what the cards are always about, because over the years I've learned they can be doorways to important information. Example, there's a card called the Three of Pentacles, and it usually shows stained glass windows in a big church and a guy is working on the wall. It talks about mastery. It talks about long term. I saw that card when I was reading for a couple, and what came out of my mouth was there is a de-consecrated or abandoned church. Uh, and it's within two miles, and that's where I think you're supposed to open up a Kathy Bakery. And they looked at each other, and they looked at me, and they go, oh, yeah, we know. We've been arguing for two years. I'm just the tube that comes through, honey. Now, um, there are also things called oracle cards. They're kind of a new invention over the past 30, 40 years. They don't have rules. They can be as many cards as you want. They can say whatever you want. They can have the, any kind of art that you want. Um, I use about seven different Oracle decks along with my regular deck. In fact, and this is something that I talk about in the book that I wrote, you've got the magic who needs a genie, which is how to be in this business. You always need a children's deck. This is cat wisdom. Why? Because if someone is coming and having a reading with me at a big crowded psychic fair, and she's got little three-year-old Muffin on her lap, and Muffin is squirmy and squirmy, says, mommy card, mommy card, mommy card. She's going to look at me and say, can my daughter please choose a card? And you can't say no. So what you do is you shuffle and you say, here, Muffin, darling, why don't you choose a card? And then you get this. Oh, look, Muffin, death. (laughs) No, <laughs> you don't do that. 
that would so, be my luck too. Yeah. Now yeah, on that so note, if, with the, sorry, go on. So you know, if the little kid pulls kitty card, you can always tell him what the kitty is saying, and yeah. mommy says thank you, and the kid's happy, and yeah. you haven't traumatized a small child. Now the death card, I guess, is one of the most uh, renowned cards in terms of movies and everything. But the death yep. card itself doesn't actually mean death, does it? It means kind of nope. great change or something. Death, the devil, and the tower are the three that people freak out about. So yeah. yes, let's look at them. The death card is death of an old way of life, death of what you've outgrown, death of what was never you in the first place. Mm -hmm. The devil card is not Mr. Horns in a tail. It is being constantly bedeviled by something, someone, or some situation, or holding yourself back from your highest and best by some bad habits. The tower card does not mean doom, gloom, and destruction. The way I explain it is it's the imploding sports stadium card. Okay. Um, who's your baseball team down there? Texas Rangers. All right. Rangers want to build a new stadium. They got to blow up the old one first. Now, Clear the ground. Or, or they do what they did and leave it literally right across the street, <laughs> rename it, and are now leasing it out to everybody else. Yeah. And That's causing true. a traffic nightmare. So uh, hey, maybe. maybe. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry. Up here, you know, New York, I'm Sox. So right. Like, you know, All right. But I'll tell you, li living in Albany, New York, you're like at the apex of the triangle. You have Yankees versus socks people arguing on every street corner so you kind of just go around it yeah anyway but those are the meanings of the cards right. um and when people learn they're nothing to be scared of yeah because now, i remind people even the best of us are 85 percent accurate the only one 100 percent accurate is god and he's not doing tarot readings this mm. makes sense now i went uh to a psychic when i was about nine or ten with a friend and it was one of those kind of festivals fairs traveling festival things and uh mm -hmm. i went with one of my buddies from school who lived just down the road from me and uh, i've told it i can't remember if i told you this story but i went in and the lady started screaming at me she goes get out get out your wolves will tear me apart and i didn't really think much about it and uh then when i moved to texas about two <laughs> years after i moved here i went to a a store in Dallas and it was kind of like shamanistic and stuff and the moment I walked in I said hi to the guy and he goes uh tell your wolves to stay outside and it was kind of a bit weird I mean I've had the nickname the wolf since I was about five or six but it just seemed very very strange and I didn't really think too much no. of it it was just a uh, kind of thing well, and i think some people have had those kind of experiences where it's kind of like well i really don't understand what this means and that kind of sends people into thinking well you know it's a whole bunch of hocus pocus and people saying ridiculous things and you know trying to get you to i guess believe something based upon the other person's belief rather than you having a belief yourself i don't know mm. if two people who do not know each other and didn't know you from adam's house cat mm. talk about your wolves mm. you've got wolf guides and wolves are very noble creatures. Me, I got ravens. <laughs> uh, that's why I chose the, the workers named Corby, because that's ravens and Gaelic. Why ravens? They are intelligent. They are they married for life. They're loyal. And they are the messengers on the magic road. They always have been. So yeah, people see me, and my nickname is Ma Feathers. So there you go. Um, good. I would say... Now, obviously, you know, the wolf of the wolf and the shepherd. Um, enjoy that energy. Look at what wolves do. Wolves live in packs. Wolves work together. And wolves can't, wolves are some of the, the toughest animals on the planet. So go see what wolf uh, energy is and embrace it because the wolves like you. I Nothing wonder, to be scared of. I wonder if mine is ducks. Because I have that fascination with ducks. I've had pet ducks. Uh, you know, looks calm on the surface, but you know, busy underneath. Uh, you know, forgive I don't know. me, but ducks, ducks. You know how all married people have married people jokes. Ours is duck. Really? Literally, literally. Uh, we were driving on on a mountain road. This is when we first were dating. And there was this wonderful little 80s rock song. And all of a sudden, Duck comes out and does this. And my husband almost drove up the road. And so this is Ducky. And 
it will bust him up no matter where Ducky comes out. So I love you for having a duck spirit guide. That's <laughs> just glorious. Well, one of our friends, uh, Eric, who we mention quite frequently on the podcast <laughs> for uh, a number of different reasons, um, I put him in touch with one of my friends who is a shaman and uh, he was trying to find what his spirit guide, his animal spirit guide was. And he had been convinced for years, oh, it's going to be a bear. It's going to be a bear. Because Eric's a big dude. He's like 6'3", six, 6'4", six, and a big, big dude. And it turned out to be a llama. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. But the guy, but the guy. Um, Why was it a llama, did they tell him? Um, the only th the only thing I can remember was that he said, you know, don't be discouraged because uh, it's actually a good sign. The llama's, you know, quite strong-willed you know kind of independent and you know it's got a and lot of good attributes at people he yeah. doesn't like and yeah got a lot of good attributes yeah so he was sure. he kind of um i guess uh embraced it after a while but he'd thought for years oh yeah it's gonna be a bear it's gonna be a big tough bear and it was a llama so yeah. since then we've bought him random llama gifts whenever we've seen them and just given to them look <laughs> they didn't tell him it was a chihuahua right. they should be right. grateful yeah yeah there you go but i think part of the uh fitting with the animal guide for eric being a llama i still think a napoleon dynamite you yeah. know in tina being tied to the fence and napoleon feeding him lasagna yeah you know? you know? <laughs> yeah because <Yeah. laughs> that 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 pretty much describes eric a little bit <laughs> okay <laughs> um, you know, when it comes to things like spirit guides and angels, everybody says, do I have, I want a message from, um, the way I explain it, remember Venn diagrams, geometry mm. classes. Well, the Venn diagram for angels and spirit guides is a donut. Angels are the whole and spirit guides are the actual donut. The idea being all angels are spirit guides, but not all spirit guides are angels. Every one of us has at least one angel who's signed up for the duration. You know, they have our names. In the back of their tunics, you know, I belong to. Spirit guides grow and change as we do. We don't have the same teacher from kindergarten to PhD. So um, your totem animal is not necessarily just a spirit guide. But for instance, when I really first started getting in touch with my own, the first guide I had was someone that I had flown with in World War I 100 years ago. He's still around. There's still a bond of affection but I work with higher level guides right now as my own work has grown and changed. So that's why I can give you a message today from Ralph the Wonder Dog, who is your spirit guide today. And in five years, Ralph may be off taking a nap and you may have your angel, Jophiel. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that I was wrong five years ago. It means that you have grown and changed. That's all. No, that makes sense. I'm, I'm wondering, you know, with, everybody going remote now, you know, remote work, you always get that. And once again, just stereotyping here, you get that stereotype picture of you enter this dark room and there's this table with a dark tablecloth, crystal ball sitting in the middle. You got lots of jewelry on, you got all this stuff and you got to sit down and be face to face. But now with all the remote work, I mean, here we are, we're talking, we can see each other. We're, you know, on video chat or whatever. Does that number one, play any part into being able to do what you do? And then number two, does that hinder the fact that maybe people are thinking, oh, she's just sitting there on Google behind the scenes because I can't see what's going on. I can't see if there's somebody behind the camera, you know, Google and stuff and holding up cards saying, you know, oh, this person was born here and, you know, so on and so forth. Number one. If I could only read you in person, how do you know I'm not reading your body language? Mm -hmm. Number two, if you need to set up a cross between the Wizard of Oz as Captain you know, Marvel and Madam Hoo-Ha to be comfortable, go do it. Does it matter? Zip. You know what's behind my curtain and my wall thing? A bookshelf in the cat box. Mm. I'm in a tiny little office. Yeah. But... The connections are made. I mean, I have clients all over the world. Someone from Bolivia does not want to come to upstate New York and see our sheep and cows. They just don't. Yeah. So it makes no difference whatsoever. No. Now, how, how much of it is actually optics? Because um, obviously you don't need certain things, but people expect certain things. And, nope. you know, I mean, how, how much stuff do you actually need? Because uh, I remember like in the 90s when all those kind of like... Uh, phone lines came in other than the talk to randy mandy for you know two dollars fifty a minute 
the psychic hotlines started coming out, charging all this. And obviously you couldn't see the person the other end. Mm -hmm. And it was the same kind of uh, theory, I guess, behind Randy Mandy was actually some, you know, 90 year old woman who weighs 400 pounds. And the same thing with the psychics. It was anybody just reading through random horoscopes. I mean, people no. feel that something has to feel or look a little bit different to almost, not necessarily take it seriously, but they expect some type of presentation, I, I guess is what I'm trying to get at. Do you expect a doctor to always give you an x-ray? No. What's wrong with you? He makes a decision. I do a lot of things. Yes, I do tarot and oracle readings. I'm a past life specialist. I do numerology. I can talk to your guides and angels. I can talk to your dead people. A lot of those don't need tools. Um, spirit uses what you're good at. Okay, because there are a lot of tools we can use. Now, example, pendulum, a little crystal and a little string gives you yeses or noes. I have a very slight benign tremor in one hand, inherited from my dad. That's why he wasn't a surgeon. So I can't trust a pendulum. On the other hand, theater major at Brown University, so I know how to get into a character's head. Author, words are my drug of choice. And I'm a history freak. I met my husband at the old Rhinebeck Aerodrome in Rhinebeck, New York. And as he says, there was this gorgeous brunette who knew the difference between a Coker Dero one and an F1 based on the wing skids, had to marry her. Now, you put all that together. When I do past lives, I have a much deeper rocket pack to pull from. Someone else who's good might say to you, uh, okay, Wolf, um, this is a life where you're female and it's a long skirt, big hat, so I know it's a long time ago. Me? I'd look at that and go, okay, female life, hobble skirt, picture hat, that kind of ostrich feather, and you're standing in front of the Brandenburg Gate. So I think it's 1911 Berlin. Which one's going to give you more information? Okay. And I can get that specific. I don't do mediumship in big galleries because I will not censor what comes out of my mouth. And it might not be what you want in public. But I have done past life galleries. Uh, first night, Saratoga. Three shows a night. 150 people in the audience and I'd randomly do 20 or 30 past lives per person or per group. Um, one woman, this was at Lilydale actually, she raised her hand. She said, why am I scared of having wet hair in my face? It was butch short. I said, okay, 1915 Lusitania. You were on the ship when it got torpedoed by the Germans. You went over the side, you hadn't bobbed your hair. Instead of the, the short, you had all the Edwardian hair, which took on a lot more water and also took on debris and pulled you down and you drowned. I opened my eyes, she's white. She says, is that why I'm afraid of cruise ships? I said, probably. Another woman wanted to know why was she always attracted to the Underground Railroad? You know, wasn't anywhere near where she lived or the family or anything. And I say, okay. I'm seeing you in a small whitewashed room uh, low ceiling so that the two gentlemen who are with you are kind of stooped over. You're leaning by a rickety iron bed. It looks like about 1862 or three based on your outfit. It's gray. It's got black soutache trim on it. And in the bed is this little shriveled black woman. And all of you are grieving because she came this close to crossing over to either Philadelphia or Boston for, to freedom on the railroad, but she's dying and she won't make it. And I opened my eyes and the woman has tears coming down saying, I've had that dream for 20 years and I never knew why. Yeah. Now, what is the thing with the whole past life thing? Because I personally have, well, I guess because of a lack of understanding, mm -hmm. difficulty kind of thinking that I've lived previously in different bodies, living different lives. But You're not smart enough to get a hold on in one, darling. Yeah. You're just not. Yeah. But the whole point is, we have karma. Karma is not bad and good. Karma is five things. Unbalanced energy, which is a neutral. Healing, service, contrast. You want to live and learn abundance. You have to be both rich and poor. Healing of beliefs. You can't do all of that in one life. So you have successive lives. Um, I had a client who was very anti-Semitic and yet born into a Jewish family. She couldn't understand why. She never felt right. We did the past life and she had been a good German soldier. They were taught Jews were animals. 
How do you change that? You go and live like a Jew in your next life to see how this is not true. And she was able to literally jettison her anti-Semitic feelings because she saw the whys. Now it wasn't punishment because a lot of people, the example I love to use is Ryan White. Everyone says, Ryan White must have been really awful if he died at 18 of AIDS. No, in my understanding, this is a life of service. The soul knew short life, tough life, but make a big difference. Why? Because he became friends with Elton John when Elton was drinking and drugging and basically driving himself into the grave. Elton became dear friends with the family, admired Ryan's courage, sang at Ryan's funeral. Ryan inspired him to get off the drink and the drugs. He's been 30 years sober and create the Elton John AIDS Foundation, which has now helped half a billion dollars worth of people, HIV and AIDS all over the world. Ryan had a life of service. If it was 18 years old, it was 18 years old. The soul doesn't count how long because the soul knows it's just a role that we play. So it, theoretically, clear. yeah. So theoretically, can you kind of like not get it, go through a whole lifetime and then have to continue going and maybe have like 20 different lifetimes or is there kind of a set amount? Of... Oh, honey, we've all had hundreds. Yeah, okay. We've all had hundreds. Yes, very much you can do that. I mean, mm -hmm. we're not all that brilliant. You know, we have these little pea brains compared to who we are when we're out of the body. Um, so it, it is what it is. But one of the reasons we don't remember all of our lives is because if we had a bunch of neat ones, we'll just sit in the back with popcorn and watch who we were and we won't live this time. You don't know how many people have told me, oh, well, I must be Anne Boleyn because I can't wear turtlenecks. <laughs> Not happening. Or can't and count on her fingers then. <laughs> No. No, 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 no. She did have six fingers on each hand, right, Anne Boleyn? No, she did not. Or did she what not? She or was had, that a myth? What it is is she had, if you can see, see that tiny little bit of a sixth finger? That's all it was. All right. But it was a sixth finger in that very superstitious time. Right. Huh. She probably had problems playing chopsticks, you know, with the extra little nubbin on there. Well, it's just like my crappy uh, little finger on this hand. I, uh, saved my son from hitting his head when he fell off a chair i dived to the ground but i got my hand caught in the chair and the crisscross kind of iron pattern twisted my finger around and you know being the typical male i never went to the doctors or anything and so slowly across about a year and a half it went from looking like that to looking like this so now i can kind of like a I'm sure I'm sure I'd be awesome at some musical instrument if I can find out what it is because yeah. I have an unnatural reach on that finger that Oh. We'll, we'll have That's to a badge ask. of honor. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we'll have to ask a uh, musical expert yeah, on musical that. Musical expert um, on that. Can I do anything with this? Be like, yeah. yeah, probably not. Yeah, stick probably to not. vocals or something. Yeah. So somebody's gonna come see you, right? Uh, what What did they need to know in their head, uh, you know, and be prepared for before they come see you? You know, if you could give them a little pamphlet to say, "Hey, you know, read this before you show up." What, Which what would I that do. be? I actually have a little ebook called Psychic Answers, but it's the first two chapters of The Psychic Elbrick Road, which I wrote for people who want to use psychic guidance but don't want to have to do it themselves. So what you need to do is accept responsibility for your part in a session. No pop quizzes, no comparisons. State your intentions clearly. Widen your horizons, evaluate your information and respond to the universe. When you sit down with me, especially since there are so many things that I can do, I will look at you and say, what's the most important thing you want to walk out of your knowing today? I don't want to spend time talking about your career and your kids if what you really want is why do I have this thing about 1642 Belgium and how's dead Aunt Mary? If people go, I didn't know, then you know, I go really Brooklyn on them. Darling, what's biting your butt? Everybody knows that phrase and everybody will be able to knock into that. Mm -hmm. um, I will give you what I see, but I, I'm the toolbox, but I'm not the repairman. Let's go back to that question. Does Bruce love me? I will do five cards. You, Bruce, the relationship, what you need to know and best possible outcome. And I'll sit back, let you digest. If you say, I still don't know what to do. 
I'll say, fine, we're going to do the three threes. Three cards for status quo. You stick with it. You kind of just bumble along. You make no changes. Three for the come to Jesus meeting where you draw the line in the sand. You do counseling. You really work on the relationship. And three cards for hospital. Bye-bye. It's been nice. I'll send you a postcard because you're gone. And unless they have told me that they are abused or battered, even if I see that they should leave, I have to allow their free will to weigh in. And I zip it. And if they say, I guess I'll stick it out. They may come back to me and say, it isn't working. And then I might say, remember what it said about leaving. Mm -hmm. But if a psychic constantly tries to tell you what to do, they are abrogating your free will and they're setting you up so that you think that they have to tell you. The reason this book was written <clears throat> 15 years ago, this was back in a massive psychic expo in Canada, like 250 people. To, uh, booths. And we saw a woman walking down the aisles looking at us and someone walks out and grabs her from the booth across the way. Now, this is one of those fake gypsies who does the long skirt and the jewelry and the headscarf and the bad accent. And that was called hooking. And it's as bad as the other kind of hooking. But she says to this person, you don't need to pay 50, 40 dollars. I reach up for 10. Come. Drags her behind the screen. 20 minutes later, we see the client leaving crying hysterically. And a bunch of us rush over, are you all right? And she said that, well, the psychic said, oh, you have a family curse. How many in your family? Four, your dog, $50 every family member, 25 for a dog, he's small, we fix. And then told the woman if she didn't burn 400 specially blessed candles at the Roman Catholic Church, I bless real good, only $1 candle. Her entire family was gonna die in a car accident in two weeks and she bought it. Mm. Now, no, do, you ever have to, do you ever have to sugarcoat stuff? Because I, when the spirits uh, converse with you, are they pretty blunt or do they kind of sugarcoat some stuff? Because in, in your kind of does Bruce love me example, and you talk to the spirits and the spirits say, Bruce would rather catch the monkey pox than look you in the face. How do you kind of convey that message to the client? Do you kind of... There is well, no true yeah. connection between you and Bruce. Right. Okay. Which is absolutely true, but doesn't stick in the night. There's no right. Okay. Guides don't have egos. They don't get their jollies by sticking you with a with a shiv. They don't. Um. So. You know, and the other thing is, I tell people: here are your opportunities. Here's how to grab them. Here's the tough stuff. Here's how to get through it or around it. Here's your toolbox. Go rock and roll. You know, I've done the cancer dance three times. Notice, I don't say I fought cancer because what you fight fights back. I don't say I survived it because I do more than hang on by teeth and toenail. A cancer dancer finds out how graceful they can be under pressure, avoids getting their toes stepped on and gets off the dance floor in one piece. So if someone comes to me and says, I'm dealing with cancer, that's one of the few times that I will explain my own experience to them because it gives them another way to look at it. And we'll talk about what they can do for themselves. I will not predict a death. Number one, I tell my guys, I don't want to know because it's unprofessional and it's illegal in a whole bunch of states. So I, you know, sometimes life is tough. That's how we learn. Mm -hmm. But I don't relish telling them horrible things. I may say, all right, the next four months, it's going to be tough. It's going to be like riding the rapids. You're going to get through this, but you have to do it by paying attention. Let's look at how. Boom, boom, boom. Right. Okay. Makes total sense. So do you feel like uh, attacked is not the right word, but maybe overwhelmed? Or, uh, well, now no, hang on. Let me finish. Get, get, maybe you do. So uh, you're... Let's use your grocery store example, or I was actually going to go the whole Halloween route and you're at a Halloween party and all that stuff. And somebody finds out, oh, you're a psychic. I mean, immediately, you know, they want to have some kind of reading, whatever. Uh, do you feel like it's like, and not to make this sound bad, but it's like, hey, you need to set an appointment. You know, this isn't the right time frame, or is that okay with you if somebody says, you know, just kind of depends. Off the if cup. it's a friend's party, I will bring my cards just in case. But if it's, um, 
I'm meeting you at a virtual business get together and you start doing that. I explain that's kind of like meeting your OBGYN at a cocktail party and you tell him that you need to see him. He lifts your skirt. He wasn't invited and it's the wrong venue. Mm -hmm. And they go, and I walk away. I have my boundaries. It's how I take care of myself. It's how I have done this for 18 years, full time. And if you're offended by that, if you say, why won't you read me for free? You're not very spiritual. I'll go, would you say to your doctor, why won't you cure me for free? You just want me to get sick and die. You're not compassionate. And they go, I would never say that. I said, professional is professional. I think so. that's so much human nature, though. I mean, years ago, I used to be an insurance agent. And I'd be at a party, you know, like you say, a cocktail party, right? And you meet somebody, you know, like, oh, what do you do? Oh, oh, I'm in insurance. Hey, I got a question for you. I've got blah, blah, blah. And then they launch into this, you know, give me some free advice on my insurance. You know, give me some free advice on some soccer skills. Or, hey, can you take my kid out back and, you know, kick him, teach him to kick the soccer ball better? Or kind of like one of the things I can tell them is, look, I do a free reading hour once a month on Facebook. You know, one quick question. But sure, go find me there. Yeah. Now, how do you differentiate between kind of positive and negative energies or kind of, I mean, I don't really understand kind of, uh, I guess, do you instantly see, because some people like if, say, uh, the shepherd or I were being influenced by something, we wouldn't necessarily be able to tell whether this was a good influence or bad influence until we got to the other side of it and see what effect it had. But are you able to tell pretty quickly when something's speaking to you, whether this is, a, I guess, a good guide or a good influence, or do you even get kind of oh, yeah. bad spirits trying to fool you? I generally don't. With you? I generally, with me, no. I generally don't. But what I've explained to people, how you know whether you're getting the right people. Um, there are certain things that um, spirit guides will not do. And number one, they will not try to build you up at the expense of somebody else. They will not chastise you in a mean fashion. They will not try to guilt you into doing anything. And they will not try to encourage you to do something illegal, immoral, or you know is wrong for you. Okay. That's your ego. Mm -hmm. That's the my aura don't stink thing. Um, when I actually channel people's souls for them, their higher selves, uh, apparently my voice changes and my cadence changes and I'll use different words. How do you know you're really channeling? People ask. Very simple. I was one of the main channels for Robert Schwartz's book series on life between lives. And in the second book, there was a chapter on miscarriage and abortion. And I channeled this woman's soul for her to speak to. Now, when that happens, you know, my, my conscious mind, I'm off, read the book. I don't know what I said. So then Rob sends me a pre-publication copy and I read through and I call him, Rob, what the hell is this? This would not come out of my mouth. And he said, do you want to hear the recording? And I go, no, because whatever this woman needed to hear is not my personal belief at all about miscarriage and abortion, but out it came. So I obviously was channeling correctly for this woman. That's key. That's key. No, that's amazing. And and by the way, and I'm I'm not trying to discountenance anything you're saying. You were excellent in your different voices too. I mean, yeah. especially <laughs> especially at Brown University, and I did voiceovers professionally. Oh, okay. Oh, there you go. Right. I mean, it, people that aren't watching it you know, on YouTube or whatever, and just listening, they would probably think, how many people does she have back there? Because, you know, we all fake our voice. I try to make a British accent all the time to sound like him, but then he makes fun of me every time because it never sounds British. But, I mean, your voices are just spot on. (laughs) One of the most hilarious things that ever happened. Um, When I was working as the executive recruiter, if... I, you know, one of our clients from London called, I'd drop into Brit and I'd say, oh, I'll have her ring you up. And it was a a comfort thing. Uh, People loved it. So the boss of the company for the Secret Santa stuff got me a t-shirt that said, you're just jealous that the voices talk to me, having no idea that I channeled. Mm -hmm. 
I wore that shirt to death. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, can I change voices if I need to? Yes. Do I sometimes change it in the channeling? Yes. But remember, spirit uses what we got. Right. So that's one of the reasons that it's easy for me to try and actually give you the accent that the person would have used when he was down here. Right. And and by the way, I'm not trying to say you're faking it by any means. It's just it's okay. amazing when you're you know, you're telling a story and, and you just switch it like that. I mean you you can tell it's you one know, of my Hun, I've done comedy, stand up comedy on you think a psychic's life is easy, and that's all part of it. Right. So. Makes sense. Now could you tell us a little bit about your book, The Psychic Yellow Brick Road and particularly why sure. you chose that title because uh, the Wizard of Oz, it's a very fascinating movie on a lot of levels. There's a lot of imagery hidden in that movie. Mm -hmm. You know, people have studied it for various reasons, whether it be like politics, culture. It's There's a lot of hidden messages in that movie. And I've heard it referenced so many times from so many different people across professions. It seems like, you know, from business people to accountants to everything. Why did you choose that title? Because of my subtitle, the main title is The Psychic Yellow Brick Road, but the subtitle is How to Find the Real Wizards and Avoid the Flying Monkeys. Oh, okay. Um, and it's a title that everybody remembers. Everybody knows The Wizard of Oz. And the flying monkeys are all the ones who are like the Madame Who Has and the Swami Salandas and the real wizards, the real psychics. You need to know how to find them. Now, you know, um, quick example. How do you find one at a psychic fair when you don't know any of us? I tell people you have to be good puppies. First, you go in and you do your walkies. You walk around, you look at everybody, you see what's there, you see who looks like they have a brain and who doesn't. Then you get paper trained. What does paper trained mean? Paper trained means that you go and you will get um, information from us about what we do. Here, is that it? No. Uh, we have rack cards or flyers. You'll read through three or four people you'll really like and you'll come and you'll talk to us if we're not busy. If we are, you'll talk to our front people. But remember, we hire them to say they love us. You want to find the testimonial books on our table. Those are comments from people that have had readings. Are we good? Are we sharp? Are we funny? Are we kind? Were they comfortable? Did we have specialties? Children, dogs, dead people? Would they come back? But the last thing is you got to check in at heart level, guys. If the psychic doesn't feel like they have a brain in their head, they really give a damn about what they're doing or they're gonna give you good information. Don't go there no matter how cool the wiki woo looks on the table. Mm -hmm. And if nobody rings your chimes, leave without a reading, there will be somebody else, I promise. That's how you can avoid getting taken by people like the fake gypsies and the Madame Who House. I think that's one of the biggest fears in somebody coming to see a psychic. Let's, you know, leave the religious aspects out or whatever, but just that fear that it's a, a Madam Hoo Ha. I, I kind of like that. Mm -hmm. I was going to use like a shyster, you know, uh, what was it, the movie Ghost, where Whoopi Goldberg, yeah. you know, ends up actually, you know, Oda having May. that power. Oda, Oda, Oda May Brown, that's right. Yeah. But, it, but then she had all the fake stuff set up. And, I know one of uh, Houdini's big things was trying to make, you know, everybody in the psychic and the, the mentalist aspect or whatever, trying to prove that all of it was just, you know, uh, for lack of a better term, garbage. It was all a sideshow deal. And mm -hmm. I remember there was a, a story told about Houdini that before he passed, he had told his wife basically a password. And he said, look, if any of these people are real, I want you to go see as many of them as you can. And she never told anybody what that password was. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of the proof that it's all, you know, hogwash. It's all for entertainment purposes only. Well, you can take it that way or not. I would not have the testimonials on my website. That was fake. I, I do this in service. Yes, I deserve to get paid. If people say, well, this is a gift from God, you should just do it for free. Well, in the old days when, you know, I would live in a, a little Celtic village in the year 304, y'all would have brought me chickens and clothing and firewood and I would read for free. These days, chickens cost money. 
So there's the energy exchange. But I tell people, don't spend more than you need to. I downsell myself. But the fact that I make a living at this means I can be there for you six days a week. It's an even exchange. Now, do you think there's a danger in some people trying to find their own way without getting advice from an expert like you? Because people dabble into certain things because of... If they, they dabble, yeah. yeah. But uh, will your life always be uh, half in color if you don't see a psychic? Oh, get real. Mm -hmm. We are a luxury. We are. Um, some people find us incredibly useful. Some people find us entertainment. Some people find us in the yellow pages. Who knows? But what I would say is learn at least how to ground, center, and shield. One, one of the things that I, I talk about, um, Kathy, I'm sorry, is Ouija boards. Uh, when I lecture, I always go, how many people here have ever used a Ouija board? And a bunch of hands go up and I go. Using a Ouija board when you don't know how to ground, center, and shield is like opening your door in a strange neighborhood and yelling free beer. You don't know who's out there, but they heard you and you're coming. And for everybody that says, well, Jane Roberts got Seth and Pat Rodegas got Emmanuel, I've had to deal with two hysterically fearful teenagers who, when they put their hands on the planchet and said, who's there? Spelled backwards very fast was, I have an ax and I'm here to kill you. Trust me, that's not your Uncle Danny. Mm -hmm. Somebody always says, but it's in the toy department. And I go, fine. Who here has a kid or a grandchild under 10? And a bunch of hands go up and say, you. What's the kid's name? Kid's name is Buster. How old is Buster? Buster's eight. Okay, fine. Buster comes home and says, Mommy, Mommy, I got all A's on my report card. You said I could go pick out a toy. Let's go. And Buster leads you into the part of the toy department that says, My first chainsaw. It's in the toy department. You're going to let him play with it by himself? I don't think so. So right. sometimes you have to give people ridiculous examples to show them what's safe and what's not. If you do that simple stuff, learning how to ground, center, and shield, yeah, go do it. I, you know, I'm not a seventh generation anything. I got a book called Opening to Channel by Sanaya Roman and Dwayne Packer. It's on the list I have for people, my top 13 books. And I taught myself, but I worked at it for a long time. I think kept making mistakes and kept learning until I knew I was good. And now I am teaching one student who I think is going to surpass me by the time she's 21. I'm sorry to interrupt you there. No, uh, no. So I think this kind of goes back to my fruit roll-up example. Somebody somewhere had to put on a fruit roll-up, remove cellophane backing before eating. Because as a society, we've gotten so dumb that you have to put warnings on everything you have to put labels on everything. And like you say, in the toy department, the, the My First Chainsaw or the Ouija board or whatever, yeah. you, so many people just don't read anything and even putting the warning on there. I'm sure there's still people that are eating fruit roll-ups with the cellophane back on there because they're just not smart enough to figure it out themselves, which kind mm -hmm. of alludes to what you're saying. So uh, just out of curiosity... And you know, and you take this how you want to take it, and you can say nope, not right now. But anything, you know, before we got together, before we started the Zoom uh, call today, before we, um, you know, got together and actually started talking, that maybe you thought about us, that some kind of thought entered your mind about either us both as a podcast, or you know, one of us, or mm -hmm. is that just not how it works? It's not how it works. Um, I think I found you on Podmatch and I read through what you were and I threw you a pitch because I liked what I read. And so we're on. All right. There you go. Um, yeah. You know, sometimes, what was it Freud said? Sometimes the cigar is a cigar. Right. Sometimes pitching a podcast is just pitching a podcast. Well, and I remember, mm -hmm. I wasn't invited to read you. Yeah, and exactly. So uh -huh. and, and that's why I asked it that way because so many people might think that, oh, you know, this was a destiny thing and blah, blah, blah. It literally was, we reached out together, you know, we exchanged messages over the internet. The wolf got a hold of you and I don't, was it phone or text or whatever? You know, th this wasn't some grand master plan that you no. were going to be on our podcast today. It, it was literally the same way that we've had 
a Tarrant County judge on here. We we did the same thing. So it wasn't mm-hmm. like the stars aligned or something like yeah. that. As I tell people in the other book, You've Got the Magic, I am one of the rare intuitives that can straddle the twin mountains of WikiWoo and good business practice. Finding you, having a great time on the podcast was good business practice, guys. Yeah. Now- I did not say, talk to them. Now, the name The Wolf and The Shepherd, uh, The Shepherd came up with it, and I guess since he came up with the name, we've tried reverse engineering a kind of meaning to it in terms of, Mm -hmm. I look at it as in duality, as in a singular person, sometimes having to be the wolf and sometimes having to be the shepherd, but then we also kind of build these stories around it of why the wolf and the shepherd got together and you know, the shepherd said, well, you know, they're always been pitched in history as being arch enemies, you know, but what if the wolf and the shepherd actually sat down and had a chat and found out they actually had a lot of things in common and they were just doing what they do to survive, but it was a completely different lifestyle. And it's a case of, you know, did I eat all the sheep or was he just clumsy and lost all the sheep? But, you know, it's, is there a reason why people choose or drawn towards certain names or things? I mean, is it just a, random or no it's not random um my legal name versus corby midline is like reginald dwight versus elton john i make sure my legal name is kept very private so i don't get calls at three in the morning right so 20 30 years ago when i was choosing a specific name to read under the popular thing for women was polysyllabic ending in a aliantha maranatha I wanted something strong. And so I went looking and I knew ravens were my babies. So I looked and saw what are ravens called in various languages and Gaelic was Corby. And I loved the sound of that. Mitleid is actually the German word for compassion. It reminds me why I do the work. So that's how I got Corby Mitleid. It is completely a chosen name. So yeah, names have, names have power. Names Tell us who we are. How many people say, don't call me Harold, it's Hank. But your name is Harold, but you don't like the vibe, you don't like what it sounds like, you don't like who you feel you are when someone says Harold. So you say Hank instead. And that's how you introduce yourself. And it it also actually works the other way around too, where you know, like mm-hmm. you introduce yourself as Christopher and like, oh, hey, good to meet you, Chris. It's like, mm-hmm. no, it's Christopher. You know, mm-hmm. So, so I, I totally get what you're saying there. Look, the, the last thing I'll say about that before we wrap up is um, I had a couple, she was extremely pregnant and it was a little boy and I channeled how the little boy was seeing things and he said that he wanted his name to be Buster. And the father looked at me and said, his name is going to be Scott Aaron Pierce the fourth and I don't want to hear anything more about it. I saw them a few years later and they nicknamed the kid Buster. There you go. Truth will out. Well, as we wrap up, can you remind everybody how to get a hold of you social media wise, your website, all that good stuff? And oh, God, of course, they can't, av- they can't avoid me. They can't. Uh, <laughs> it's very simple. CorbyMitlive.com is the website. It's there are articles and it's where you can set up a reading with me. It's where you can get my books. Um, if you want to attend my free reading hour once a month, I think the next one is September 19th. You go into Facebook at Fire Through Spirit. Uh, Fire Through Spirit. Um, then there's Pinterest and Instagram and YouTube and Patreon, and they're all under Corby Mitlide. Simple as that. Great. And by the way, we're going to have all those on our website as well, uh, yes. all your links and all that good stuff. Hey, Corby, super glad you could take some time out of your day to join us. I yeah, know I. I know I learned a lot about this Mm -hmm. and uh, probably be following up with you with some just, you know, personal questions that we won't throw out here. But with all that said, thank you for tuning in to this episode of The Wolf and the Shepherd, and we will catch you on the next one.